Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. excellent. Uh, hello, I'm Felipe Hoffa, Google Cloud Developer Advocate. Um, I started as a software engineer eight years ago at Google, and then six years ago I became a developer advocate. If you don't know what a developer advocate is, it's basically a software engineer with a license to speak. And I travel the world, I go to conferences, I show what I've done, um, I love playing with data, and this, this next 30 minutes are going to be all about data. So just to start the motivation here, if we get this on screen. Um, oh, maybe I need to fix something here. Oh, I need to connect again to the presentation. And can you see me now? Home cinema, boom. Yeah, no, that's the Apple TV password, and I should be able to connect to the home cinema as I was connected to it five minutes ago, but I'm not connected anymore. Any idea our awesome desk? I could see my screen there five minutes ago when we tested it. Do I need to turn off my computer and turn it on again? Could not connect to home cinema. Oh, no. We were able to do this. Okay, give me a second and we will be up in at any minute. Turn Bluetooth off, turn Bluetooth on. Sorry. It's like, yeah, now we have looking for Apple TV. Technical problems, and we try to have everything in place before this. Open display preferences. I'm looking for, for AirPlay display and it's just gone. This is so sad. Yeah, that is me and that's Jacob Smith from Packet. <laughs> um, this is not my presentation. <laughs> Uh, I will turn off my computer or we can present from a different computer. If I can share my slides with anyone else, I can use a different computer too. So that's plan B. Who wants to, to get my slides? I will turn on off this. Let's make like nothing has happened here. I'm restarting my computer now unless someone has a better idea. what we should do is we should switch the order. Yeah. And we'll start, we'll start with Jacob first, and then we'll get this fixed in the interim, and then we'll come back. So if you could grab your laptop and bring it over to the, the, well done. the guys over there. Thank you. Sorry for that. I'll be back. Okay. Are you sure? Okay. Okay. Thanks for the warning, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is supposed to work. Is in, ball, is in ballroom A, down in the end. It's actually not pizza, but there is beer. So we had a choice of one of the two. We went with the second one. No, there will be all, actually all sorts of food there, all sorts of good food. And thank you for sponsoring it. We really appreciate that. I was expecting pizza. Yeah. Yeah, you can't put the slides up. <laughs> I, think, I think my slides are there. Thank you. Yes. Oh. I can go. <laughs> it's good to you. <laughs> How much time do I have left? You have about five minutes. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Do your thing. 
Um, <laughs> boom, hey. yes. All right. Woo. Thank you, Demogods. Um, so let me tell you some stories with data, and I will have, have to go faster than I have thought of, so let me quickly give you the intro. What do you see here? TensorFlow, source code, but you, I also see a lot of information. I see a license, I see a copyright, I see some import libraries, and if you look from the, the big picture, there's even more data, there's number of stars, number of uh, forks, how many pull requests. So what I'm trying to say here is that I see data. And I have it with big, uh, big letters because this is big data. And I love <laughs> analyzing the stuff. So for example, if you had access to 400,000 GitHub repositories, a billion files, and 14 terabytes of code, what would you do with this? What kind of questions would you like to answer? Um, a very important question, I think, for all of us is tabs versus spaces. <laughs> What's the right one? Any, any fans of tabs here? Spaces? OK, let's see what the, does the data say. Um, I wrote a blog post about this. It's published. You can go and find it. Uh, first, I had to define my rules. I only wanted to see repositories that had certain number of stars, only big files. I counted how, how many lines starts with tabs, how many with spaces. And then I wrote a query to first extract all of the source code that I had ready on the query to be analyzed. I extracted the files that I was interested in. And then this is my query that encapsulates the rules. This is how I want to measure if one file counts for tabs or spaces. And the results after 13 seconds are this. In most languages, people prefer spaces. Uh -huh, you're happy about that. Except in C, it's 50-50. And if you really, really like tabs, you should use Go. 100% tabs. So yes, you ha there is a place for you. Um, there's a, many more questions that I would like to ask, and I'm going to answer some of them now. First, I want to show you some of what, how I got invited to present here. So for example, I was looking at GitHub at the top countries. So each user on GitHub has the choice of displaying where they're coming from. So what are the top countries on GitHub? What's the top one? Top country, according to this query, is null. <laughs> Because a lot of people choose not to choose where they're coming from, but then it's the USA, India, China, Great Britain, etc. cetera. Uh, you can put this in a map by activity, like who, which countries are doing more pushes. But this is kind of unfair, because basically you're counting the countries with the largest populations. If you divide it per capita, you get, you get a map, a different kind of concentration. If you go straight to the data, you will see that the Top concentration per capita programmers, you can find it on Iceland, followed by Sweden, Norway, New Zealand, Denmark, Switzerland, cold countries. <laughs> and of course, once you say that, you would love to see if that is true. So where would coders go, cold countries or hot countries? And I got the weather station for the whole world for every country, so I have here the average weather for each. Sta uh, weather station on each country. You can see that you can run countries by which ones are the hottest. You can guess that Thailand is up and to the right. Um, then you can join both results and you get a chart like this. And indeed, colder countries, those in yellow, Iceland, Sweden, have the highest concentration of programmers. The hottest countries uh, have the lowest concentration of programmers. Um, Southeast Asia is in green and you can see that Singapore is that exception right on top uh, that has a very high concentration of programmers. And my guess is that, yes, people love when they have access to air conditioning and <laughs> so they don't have to leave. Thailand is a little lower there, but also the extreme of hottest countries. Um, I'm also, this is one of the, my favorite charts that I published. What are the top uh, companies contributing to open source? Uh, at least on GitHub. Uh, what are your guesses? Mm, Linaro. Linaro is a good company contributing to open source. Um, but these were my results. And I'm looking at three different dimensions here. Uh, the number of people for that company that I could find on, on GitHub. 
up to the right is Microsoft. They have a lot of people on GitHub. But then on the other dimension, I'm counting uh, to how many repositories they have contributed to. And that's Google. That also shows up as a bigger circle because these projects are getting more stars. Uh, and then you can see number three there, Red Hat. Red Hat gets a lot of contributions into open source. And of course, Apache, Facebook, Intel, and more companies, Pivotal, IBM. I updated this chart to 2018. Uh, you might see one of the cloud providers does not have a lot of presence here, but at least they are getting better year over year. And for me, it's really, really interesting to see this and find what's happening, and these companies uh, get more, uh, for example, Adobe saw this report, and they got a lot of motivation to do more, and I've been talking to them a lot. I love what they've been doing. To build a chart like that, this was my query. It has a lot of uh, choices I had to make, but at least I made them, and I'm glad if someone wants to fight me with data, with different queries, we ha all have access to the same data. But for this talk, I also want to look beyond GitHub. Uh, we can look at Stack Overflow, Hacker News, Wikipedia, PyPy, and let's talk a, lot, a little bit about ARM. Where would you go to find more about ARM? One of the good starting places is uh, Wikipedia. Uh, you can also not only find the page for ARM, you can also find the page for Linaro, uh, which also sh this shows that some of the key people for Linaro is Mr. Lee Gong. Uh, this is the page for Gong Lee, which is <laughs> not the same person. <laughs> but what I love about this page is that right there on top, they offer you to find the computer scientist, Lee Gong, computer scientist. And this is his page. He does have a Wikipedia page. Thank you, Mr. Lee Gong. Um, now, if we want to see a little more, a little more of context, we could go for, sorry? There is no link back. There is no? You go to Gong Lee, you have a link to Lee Gong. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, no, no one is directing the other ways. That's true. And that's a great question, but the first question I have is how many page views is each one getting? So again, I can run a query like this. <laughs> and this is a chart week by week since 2015, and you can see ARM on top, that's getting like three orders of magnitudes more page views than Linaro in red, and in yellow, Mr. Lee Gong, that had some really interesting picks uh, last year. We can guess why, but let's not go deeper on that, but just to compare a number of page views, the actress Gong Lee is getting <laughs> not as many page views as ARM, so I find that cool. <laughs> now, you might also ask how people are moving from page to page, and Wikipedia publishes this data, so with a query like this, I can see what is their next web page. In this case, for example, from ARM architecture, people click to ARM holdings, or to RISC, or to microarchitectures, Qbox, and some CPUs. From the Linaro page, they jump to ARM architecture, the heterogeneous system architecture, HSA, and there's also 52 people that have clicked to <coughs> Lee Gong, the computer scientist. From Mr. Lee Gong, there are 328 clicks to Akadine Technologies, and that's all I could find. But it's also interesting to see how people arrive to Mr. Lee Gong page, and that's a different query, and my results here are, for example, a lot of people are coming from David Wheeler's page, uh, which was Mr. Lee Gong's professor, I think. Uh, he can confirm. Uh, also, you have 345 clicks from Gong Lee. <laughs> so yes, people are coming, <laughs> are using that link. People are interested. And you have, of course, uh, 52 clicks to Linaro. And this is, blah, blah, blah. this is how people are getting to Linaro from our holdings from the comparison of single board computers, uh, free and open source graphic device driver. Um, you can see the rest. I have to go faster because I have five minutes less than I expected. Same how people are getting to ARM architecture. Uh, one of the top um, referrers to the ARM architecture is x86. So at least you can see a good relationship there. Um, 2006, that's when Hacker News is born. Uh, I have a full copy updated daily of Hacker News with BigQuery, and you can go and query too. With a query like this, you can find the first uh, five news on Hacker News. These were the first five posts. 
Wired declared that the desktop is dead in 2006. Um, also October 2006, uh, Google YouTube acquisition announcement could come tonight. I think it did happen. And these are the first news that mention ARM on Hacker News. And the first two are about, the first one is ARM is ready for iPhone. Then you also have that ARM to show Google phone prototype next week. A new iPhone chip will cost an ARM and a missile. This is September 2008. Um, you could get a little bit more context with a query like this. You can see what was the top news on Hacker News that day. And when, the new, when we had the new iPhone team, will cost an arm and a missile. Uh, that's the same day that Stack Overflow launched. And this is how I pivot to Stack Overflow. Well, that was born in 2008. And these were the first questions for arm, with that arm tag on Stack Overflow. Um, native code disassembler. And the last one there is process for reducing the size of an execut executable. And it's all about context. You want to see. How many, of these, how many page views each of these questions have received through all of these years. And I have that data too. Uh, some questions like, is GCC broken when taking the address of an argument on ARM 7 TDMI? That question in 11 years has got 1,000 page views. Uh, the top one here from the early questions is how to, uh, the process for reducing the size of an executable for embedded system. That one has 12,000 views. But the top questions, um, ever that have received the most page views for ARM? Can you guess which one is the top one? Any guess? The top one is people that want to know the difference between ARM and x86. More than 130,000 page views. But when I analyze the Stack Overflow, I don't only want to see the top questions ever. I want to see what are the top questions now. And so I can take two different snapshots and compare the number of page views. And this is my result for what's happening right now. The top question for page views right now is people that want to know the difference between ARM64 and ARMHF. I don't know if you have the answer, but uh, yes, that, a lot of people are interested in that. Same, they want to see if there is a difference between ARM64 and AR64. I asked that uh, dinner last night. Uh, I got two different answers. One was a long answer. The other one was, a, oh, they are exactly the same. <laughs> but a lot of people have been confused about this. In fact, you can also find the whole trend of how Stack Overflow questions go up and down. You can see a lot of stability on the top questions. The green line that jumps in 2017 is people that want to know the difference between R64 and AR64. And somehow, a lot of people are asking now that the one on purple, what's the delay in the whole library to just make some lead, lead, uh, lead blinks, blinklets. Uh, you can also see the full, the trend. Is ARM growing or getting less pages? And you can see here that ARM has a, in conjunction, all of the ARM questions have a stable number of page views every quarter. But the number of new questions every quarter is going down. Um, just to put some context here, I will compare it with BigQuery, which is a Google Cloud product that I'm using to run all of these queries. Uh, BigQuery is getting more page views every quarter. Now, in total, we have the same as ARM. Uh, but BigQuery has more new questions every quarter, which shows that ARM is getting more page views per question. Again, to, to put some context, if we wanted to compare these trends to how many page views and questions JavaScript is getting, Python, uh, that's Python on green, just growing like crazy. And the two lines on the bottom, just flat, that's BigQuery and ARM. Oh. And you can also ask questions like, what are the top questions for ARM and Python? Uh, like people that are using both of these tags. Uh, the first one is how to install Python for ARM in AMD64. And then you have a lot of people now suffering that want to do a Bazel cross-compile of TensorFlow for ARM. I don't know who has gone through that problem, but uh, I was getting reactions for Bazel earlier. But you can go deeper into each of these questions, and I just have to go fast. You will also find that some of these questions, for example, how to cross-compile Python packages like NumP for ARM is getting views but it has zero answers. So if you have answers to questions like this, please come to Stack Overflow, please contribute because people are waiting for them. 
Speaking of Python, uh, I also have stats to of how many people are installing, doing pip install or other Python PyPI installs. And this is how I find the top installs on Python the, on an ARM CPU. These are the top projects. Six, 35 requests, IDNA, pip, pop, pop. There's one that's different than the others. Can you tell which one is a different one? At least when we are talking about ARM. I want to see which proportion of these packages is getting a lot of installs in ARM. Some packages are super popular, but they are just super popular everywhere. So if we look at the proportion, the only one that has more than 1% ARM, in fact, 16% of the installations are for ARM, is PAHO MQTT. And then if we want to find the top downloads for ARM that have the top uh, percentage of downloads, the top one is TZ update. Like, 79% uh, of TC update installs are for ARM. I don't know if you could tell that, but there's a lot of interesting packages here being installed in ARM. I'm glad that you are taking pictures. I can also share the slides with you later. And you will find a lot of installs, a high percentage for ARM are going to, coming from the Google Assistant library. Um, let's talk a little bit about GitHub, some things I found there. Uh, these are, for example, projects with ARM that mention uh, I'm looking for issues that mention ARM, and I'm looking the, for the top projects that are mentioning ARM uh, on their issues. And then I'm removing everything that's coming from the Microsoft ARM templates that are something completely unrelated. Um, yeah, the top project is ARM Embed, ARM Software, ASCII Disco, and then Azure and Microsoft not only have their own ARM thing, there's, they are also working a lot with ARM and it's really interesting to start doing discovery around all of these projects. And these, for example, are also the top projects with Linaro issues. This is where people mention Linaro on them. Uh, I don't have enough time, but I'll leave you the, the desire to go and find all of these things and find what projects are interested in Linaro. And here I'm taking people that have starred ARM projects, the two top ARM projects, and then I'm looking at what else have they started on GitHub. And you have projects like Zephyr, LG, LBGL, Riot, QNPAC, etc. And of course, Google flat buffers that are also important in this world. And of course, Linaro asked me to find how many people are contributing to the kernel from Linaro. And these are your top contributors to the kernels. Thank you, Linus, Anders, Art, and everyone else. I don't need to go deeper on that because Linaro is already measuring all of this, so I didn't go really deep, but at least I tried to show some of this. Let me come back to Hacker News because a lot of people discuss technology on Hacker News, and I want to find there when people are talking about Linaro in Hacker News. Um, this is my query, basically. I'm doing a regular expression for Linaro and trying to find them comments not only when the article says, uh, the, the title of the article scenario, I also want to find when people just drop in and talk about it in any other post. And these were my, my Hacker News mentions for Linaro between 2012, 2010 and 2013. Um, in fact, the first one was in 2010 when it was announced that ARM, IBM, and Samsung, and TI were forming a new company and people started talking about Linaro that day. Um, this one I found really interesting. 2013, there's a discussion about OpenSUSE Linux 12.3, and they immediately talk about Greg Cage gave a talk at Linaro Connect recently. So you can see that Linaro is having this presence outside of your own mailing list on the general discussion, and it's really, really interesting to go deeper into what people are talking about Linaro, when are they mentioning it, uh, these are the last, the latest posts. Of course, you have, uh, two weeks ago, Linus Torvalds on why ARM won't win the server space. But Linaro also has a presence there. People are using it to discuss, same as Spark Boost 3000 ST, et cetera, et cetera. And wow, I went really, really fast, even with last time. So let me start closing here. We can do any live queries that you want to. I'm happy to answer questions. But this talk is about data. A lot of this data is available for you right now. If you want to run any of these queries, uh, Google Cloud has BigQuery ready. We have a free terabyte 
for everyone to run any queries that you would like at any moment. Just go there and you get a free terabyte every month, no credit card needed. You will find GitHub Activity, GitHub Files, Stack Overflow, Hacker News, Wikipedia Page Views, the navigation, PyPy installs, and a lot more. Uh, this is a blog post that I wrote with all of the instructions to just start running the first queries. And you have any questions, this is a good time to go through them. Uh, you can find me on Reddit, you can find me on Stack Overflow, and if you have any feedback for me, that's a great place to give me feedback. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> Thank you so much, Philippe. I think if anybody, if we had one or two questions, we could take it. Anybody? Mm -hmm. Anybody have a question? Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And you'll be, will you be around for the rest of the day? Sure. Will you be around for the rest of the day? Okay, so anybody can corner you and ask more questions. Thank you very much. So now I would like to introduce Elsie Wallig, who is uh, responsible for our Little and Our Data Center group. Okay, thank you, Joel. Well, thank you, Felipe, for that great uh, talk about big data. I loved it. Um, so I'm happy to be here today to introduce the Arm on Arm Summit. And let's see, oh, here's your clicker. All right. Um, so what brings us here? And moving? There we go. Lenaro was started eight years ago. And during, I mean, remember my very first Lenaro Connects, I remember hearing the rumblings people would ask. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could just develop on ARM for ARM for whatever our target area is? And that's what brings us here today. Eight years later, we're starting to see the momentum. We have developer boxes from Synquasar. There is a Chromebook from Qualcomm, and it's running Windows. There's instances in the cloud. There's bare metal clouds. It's really exciting, and we're starting to see servers um, in the marketplace in some, in some data centers really uh, filling out the landscape. All for what? Targeting um, any kind of device that you might be want to build, be it small or large. So we're really filling out the landscape. Um, here today, we've got a lot of people that are going to talk to you about what they're doing in that space. Um, so we could have thought initially, um, we could think about it, we could wish about it, we could hope. Maybe we could pray it could happen, but we are making it happen, and that's what we're doing here. So today we're all here, and uh, you know I want to ask you to think about if there's a part of running on arm, arm on arm that you're not able to see today, if there's a gap, think about what can you do about it, and talk to your friends. That's what we're here for. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Jacob and uh, let him talk to you about the Packet Cloud. Thank you. OK, test, test. All good? Well, it's completely unfair to have me speak after a professional developer evangelist with big data. That's just not, <laughs> not cool. Uh, and it only reinforces my impression from this week, which is that if, if you read the Harry Potter books, like, this is a room full of wizards, and I'm a muggle. So <laughs> you're going to get a little bit of a different perspective here. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I did do some quick uh, Googling while uh, Philippe was presenting all of his search queries, or I guess big, big queries, uh, because my background actually is in um, search engine marketing and a bunch of other things. And if you run a, 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 a Google search trends, which I can't show you because I just did it, uh, and, you, and you take a look at Raspberry Pi, it's like this. And then if you look at Kubernetes, it's like this. So there, at the beginning of this year, uh, Raspberry Pi was three times the amount of search volume as Kubernetes. And now it's about 50% uh, more. So the way of the world. OK. So today I'm going to talk about the attack of the millennial IT buyer, a little background about me. Um, so I'm a co-founder of a company called Packet. Uh, you see our name here a lot. We're very happy to sponsor. Uh, Lenaro Connect. Um, my background, like I said, is in marketing, uh, which uh, I think uh, Mel Brooks said it best. Uh, marketing, 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 right? I mean, it's basically knowing the customer. 
And I've had a long, long history of doing that in a variety of roles. Uh, but at Packet, that means product, it means selling, it means ecosystem, it means community. And it's a big part of how we understand the customer and build the right product for them. Uh, my background, officially, what I actually know how to do is I know how to play the bassoon. So if, uh, if, if you ask people in our company, you'll find that most people are completely unqualified for technology. They have a theater degree or a history degree or something else, but found their way into technology in a way that I think a lot of us in this room did. So a little bit about us before we get going on the topic. So this is the official statement here. I'll tell you what I tell my mom is that we turn computers on and off. That's what we do for a living. <laughs> and what I told Michael Dell when he invested in our, in our company uh, two years ago is I say, I sell servers to your kids. So that's kind of informing a little bit about what we do. It's, nothing, it's no rocket science. Right? We make servers on, off with you know, your stuff and not someone else's. But essentially, the experience of who we do that for is really important to why we exist. So if you don't know about us, we're a public cloud on one side. Um, we'll talk to you about some of the other things we do. But we have many pins on the map. This is one element of what we do. The main reason why we do it is to be in touch with the world of software. Software is built now in the cloud. We'll talk a lot about arm on arm. And my colleagues earlier were talking about a, a, a duck. I guess it's not a nook. It's a duck. Uh, about how software gets inspired and tested locally and what, what, what all that's about. But we, we believe the cloud is the, is the consumption model, the way that software is built because of the, the developer experience. And that's why we're in the public cloud business. Uh, we also offer our same you know, expertise of turning computers on and off in a few other ways. Uh, the second one is an on-premise solution. So that's for companies that want to be public clouds, essentially. They want to automate um, infrastructure at the lowest levels so that they can put all the different things on top of it that they need for their 150 internal clients uh, in their 50 or 75 locations with their tens of thousands of servers, right? And we help to enable other companies to do that. Uh, we also offer an edge model, which for us is a go-anywhere model. It's not a uh, flying taxi model yet. It's not a uh, uh, personalized medicine in flying taxi model yet. <laughs> it's really a how do I put the cloud experience everywhere with my opinion. Okay. So last little bit of why we started Packet, and, and we'll go into the topic for today, which is we saw a few trends. The first was a, kind of an opposing thing, which the Lenaro community will know very well. Uh, in the public cloud, which has been an enormous transformative wave, uh, developers were essentially being pushed away from software through different layers of abstraction, which also made it way easier. Yeah? And on the other side, we saw open source, especially, eating its way down. You know, we go back to virtualization, then we, we look at containers, now we look at networking. It just keeps pushing its way down the stack. So we saw those things in opposition. Okay? The next was a move from generic to specialty hardware. And that happens at scale, right? So when we talk about you know, these, they started out somewhat generic and that over time have become incredibly specialized so that you can deliver the experience at scale uh, with the efficiency, with the costs, with the battery life, whatever it is. So when workloads get sufficiently big enough, you tend to start customizing the hardware, okay? And we, most importantly is we thought there was a new buyer coming and we'll talk more about that. So the opportunity that we wanted to solve was that we thought all market leaders of the next 10 years would be technology enabled. But only a handful of companies were really good at doing it, right? really good at being a public cloud on the side. And so we wanted to see who could help, which ecosystem would come together to help service those one or 2,000 enterprises who were going to try to win with technology. OK. So we get asked this question a lot. We've been in the ARM space about two and a half years. I remember when I was in Tokyo uh, closing my Series A funding round with SoftBank, who is an investor in us. Uh, and they said, this is amazing. We love it. It's a great story. But what, what's this ARM thing you're doing? Because <laughs> we were building an ARM server with Larry and the team at Cavium and Foxconn uh, to release in our public cloud. And then about four weeks after our round closed, uh, SoftBank bought ARM. <laughs> and so they were like, brilliant. Fabulous idea. Best idea ever. <laughs> so I'll tell you the real reason why we got involved was not because there was some massive market uh, just waiting to be tapped. 
so much money in the public cloud for ARM, it was really because we saw an ecosystem that aligned with where we thought things were going. Something that was diverse and specialized and good at doing it, like actually wanted to do it. Um, and that the, the partner ecosystem really made that happen. That that was a strength. And when we looked around, we saw ARM as that ecosystem. Uh, plus, we think that the battle scars of earning your way into, uh, into a world um, which this community here has done a lot of the work, uh, is really important for what comes next. So we have a few partnerships. One of them is Works on ARM. You see Ed and Carl and other people on my team who helped us support open source software really by providing infrastructure uh, from a variety of partners, including Marvell, formerly Cavium, uh, now Ampere, who we have a public cloud relationship with, and of course we're helping with our team with LC now on board to support that work as well. We can talk more at the booth. Okay. So let's go. Enter the millennial IT buyer. So this is what we call the buyer of today. This is what we see as driving both the public cloud and the enterprise uh, spending of today. They are uh, people we all know well. Some of us are that guy. <laughs> uh, and, and we just kind of look at this as a generational shift. So here we have you know, basically IT spenders who got email after they had kids. I love that one. And the best one is at the bottom is, you know, laugh when, when, when basically people don't understand how complicated it is, right? When these developers who just, just spin stuff up and do it don't really understand how computers work. <laughs> and that really gets at them. So I see this as where we're at now in a very mature public cloud market uh, and also in the enterprise IT space. This is what I call, like, this is the golden buyer that we're all chasing is this fully empowered, like worked at Google, but now runs a SaaS startup. Uh, you know, this is someone who actually knows how it all works. You know? And we, we use this with uh, Oregon Trail, if any of you guys know the game. We grew up in the US with a game called Oregon Trail. And it's actually a, a phrase, the Oregon Trail generation, which is anyone born between like the late 70s and early 80s who both had an analog phone at home and got a computer when they were like 10. And that sort of bridging the analog and the digital has you know, informed a lot of people as they go out and they built things like ISPs and you know, businesses, first round of cloud, all that stuff was, was, was really native to them and very interesting. And they have a lot of experience now, so they're really, really attractive buyers. But tomorrow's buyer is way different. Um, I was talking to someone on the walkover last night to dinner from Xilinx, I can't remember your name forget. And, and we were talking about this. He was like, what, what's your keynote about? And he's like, oh, that's my daughter, Emily, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> she knows technology. She's the daughter of two, I think, distinguished engineers, right? Has a history degree or some sort of a liberal arts degree. And, and, you know, is grown up in a different way. And when you look at demographics, and I'm sure Philippe could help me do it with more data, you see that this is the buyer over 10 years from now who is the decision maker. Right now, they're an influencer. You know, they're the ones kind of coming at it with a software first, you know, built in the cloud, you know, very agile, uh, you know, complete native uh, personality. Um, but over the next 10 years, that's actually who we're selling to. And so, you know, they have some different things, you know, very instant, right, very curious. They also don't have our baggage, our baggage of remembering how it never worked, right, how hard it was. <laughs> and that's kind of an interesting asset that we have as we go into this this next phase. I hope you like the avocado toast. That's the millennial. Right. Okay. So why does this matter? So if we're interested in selling to these biggest buyers who will deploy, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of IT spending, maybe like, you know, not in the same way that the previous you know buyer did. They may not even like to go to steak dinners. They want to be referred to you by their friends. You know, these sort of like demographic shifts inform who we're selling to and how they want to buy. So the second trend, aside from the new buyer, is hardware. So we talked about you know, why we started Packet, what was we saw a different world in which hardware kind of mattered more, and yet it needed to be delivered to a developer. So you can see why we started a bare metal cloud, which is like the experience of the cloud. I get it in a few minutes. It always works. I don't have to buy a data center. And yet I get to actually go and touch it and like innovate on it. Okay? So if you've seen this episode of Silicon Valley, this is when they decide to go to the enterprise. <laughs> and they decide, well, then we have to get our own data center space. And they get lost in the data center, which I think is classic. 
But there's this great quote that, if any of you know it, from Alan Kay, which is essentially anyone who really cares about the software will also build their own hardware. They'll, they'll at least have their opinion, okay? And I think we can look at a few things over the last 10 years to think about that. So first of all, I think that Philippe mentioned some as well. We had Hacker News being born and, 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 uh, and other forums like that, but also we were just getting started here on a number of things. You know, the iPhone was just getting launched. AWS had yet to have a reInvent, which is crazy, right? <laughs> and you know, things like self-driving cars and all these things were very, very, very forward-looking. Now they don't seem so impossible. So today, it's a changed world. We have a consumerized version of IT, and I'd say this entire slide here is basically thank you to the public cloud. Right? Public cloud has democratized IT, said it can move faster, it can be automated for a developer, you can, you can get it fast, and then they've also shown the way to a new kind of architecture, right? Disaggregating hardware, reinventing the data center, designing all those things from scratch because the scale at which they're operating is so big. And if you go back to my, my early statement, right now there's only 10 or 15 companies in the world who are really good at doing this, right? Who have kind of defined it. But there's another few thousand who want to look like that. Yeah? And that's really where we're, we're, we're seeing it. So the next thing is open source. And I wish you could see the GIF. It's not moving, but you know, it's the one where everyone's typing. And open source has really changed the world, right? And we all live in that, we all live in that world. But to think about you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you kind of knew if you were making new hardware, who you had to call to get adoption with. Like, okay, let's go talk to Microsoft, you know, EMC, you know, VMware, let's talk to the, you know, we could literally pick up the phone. And now we're in an ecosystem in which you just don't even have the choice because the person who maintains the project for free doesn't have a phone number you can call. <laughs> and yet that's what your biggest customer has a dependency on, which is a really, really tricky world. So immense community, huge surface area, and usually money alone can't make it happen. You can't just be like, where's the NRE to get the support? Because sometimes, it's just being invented, or the guy doesn't care, or there's so much of it that you can't possibly do it. A good case in point. So this is a four-year-old ecosystem. And you, know, you can't even zoom in enough to get all the logos. <laughs> this is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the Cloud Native ecosystem, which is, like any other ecosystem, just moving really fast. Software moves fast. And so what we have is software starting to move at Hardware, or hardware starting to move at software speed. That's where we're going. So 10 years from now, we think that you're gonna have a lot more change than we had over the last 10 years, that software will be the driving factor, but hardware is gonna matter a lot more, and that new experiences like flying taxis are gonna define what that infrastructure needs to look at. So I'm gonna skip this one because we already covered the unicorns. Okay, unicorns everywhere. So what are some ideas on how we can approach this? We talked about software kind of setting the pace. That's a really hard challenge. Hardware is more important, and the buyer is different. They're sophisticated, they're empowered. When they worked at Google, it was the data center was solved. You know, you could just get more of it. It always worked. They made new technology all the time. But that's a little different when you're, when you're not a public cloud on the side. So we think about this. First of all, access. Right? So we're doing some stuff at Packet with, with ARM, but also with Intel, and also with RISC-V, and also with whatever, which is how do I give access to the builder, the innovator, right? We think a big part of that is you double down on open source. It is a huge ecosystem, but if they are your friend, you can ask stuff of them, right? If you are doing a transactional relationship with open source, it's pretty difficult. It's pretty difficult to ask them to do what you wanna do uh, because you don't have the relationships, okay? We think the experience is really key. I don't know how many people buy their phone in cash, uh, but most of us are probably on the uh, Apple upgrade plan or the Samsung plan where every you know, 12 or 14 months you just get a new phone. But if you want a $10,000 server um, and next year's GPU is better than last year's GPU, what do we do about it? We say buy it all again in cash up front, put it in a data center, do all the things, get rid of the old ones. I mean, you, I, went, went, I went with my brother the other day to the Apple store because his phone was charging slowly or whatever. He walked in and within six minutes, 
walked out with a new phone with his data transferred. It was like ridiculous experience. But that's kind of what's setting the stage. Same thing with getting a taxi. It used to be really hard. Now it's really great. And I think that's where we're at as an ecosystem when it comes to how are we going to deliver the IT that helps you win, that helps you define your business. Are we going to ask you to jump through all the hoops and say, well, you know, it's hard or it doesn't boot or maybe I could sell this to you now and you could figure out how to use it. I mean, all those issues, right? They're hard issues. Um, but that's the kind of experience that I think our buyers are looking to engage in, okay? And I think the last one is really cool to this community, which is to stay close to the builders and the makers because we're entering a phase now where the problems are not all solved. Like if we take the premise that, you know, the, the easy stuff, the generic stuff, like my, my email server that I used to have in the closet is now in the cloud. You know, the database got bigger. That kind of stuff is pretty well taken care of. Now I want to like send rockets to Mars and make cars drive themselves. Now we're talking about hard problems that are, you know, literally requiring new invention. And we're seeing kind of these two worlds collide. You've got the people from the embedded space who like fully expect that it won't work, right? <laughs> In fact, that's why I need it on my desktop so I can like look at it and maybe solder something on and try it. And then you've got the, the developer eating down and, and, and starting to say, well, huh, networking, interesting. Maybe I could redo how that works and use service mesh and do it differently. And they're starting to work further down and touch the hardware. And I think those two things colliding are basically signs that we're, we're talking to people who are, are, are looking to build and make, not just buy, right? That they're actually partners to our ecosystem. So here's my call to arms, OK? Uh, we have these stickers outside. They're sort of illicit stickers because I think the branding's not quite right. But if you like them, we like them. Uh, and our call to action is to you know, join us in that distribution model, which is more than just you make stuff, pack it, buys it, we resell it. We really see like a change in the model in which companies like Packet, but also AWS, are really distribution channels for the technology that we all create. And ARM is a really unique ecosystem because it's actually designed to do that. <laughs> it's actually designed to listen to what someone wants and then make it which is a crazy awesome thing. Uh, the second one is with software, like let's talk about how to accelerate each other's work. Is that access? Is that, you know, using BigQuery to find all the problems? You know, what, what is it that drives that speed of uh, innovation and yet gives us an experience, an unboxing experience, an upgrade experience, whatever it is, that makes people want to buy more and buy faster and re-architect and invest? And the last one is today's an arm on arm day, and I actually think I completely misread it. Uh, everyone was talking about arm on arm, uh, and I heard how do we all run on arm and how do we show people that we can do it? <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people are hearing it the other way as, well, how do I develop arm on arm? And I think that's a really interesting moment because of course I'm the muggle in the room <laughs> who's thinking about how do we show the ecosystem of buyers that we're ready for them. And I think that's a really interesting thing that we'll probably talk about more today. Uh, so if you're ready to run arm on arm, if you want to show what kind of amazing things we can do as an ecosystem, we'd love to help. Um, we're in the turn servers on and off business, so we can do that for you if you want. And this is my final slide. If you remember that I'm not going to dance and do the whole developers, developers, <laughs> right? But, but my mantra is ecosystems, ecosystems, ecosystems. I think it's this amazing strength that we have as a, you know, 10 or 15 year ecosystem. We've got battle scars. We know what it takes. We can come together. We can look at how we invest. And we can create something that actually is really well suited to what's happening next. So, you know, ecosystems, ecosystems. All right, that's me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hey, good, yeah. Got it. Okay, so we're a little bit ahead of time, surprisingly, right? So uh, I thought.